Welcome to Bring Your Brilliance. Are you ready to find and amplify your voice? Looking to be inspired by those who are already out there making it happen? Listen in as we shine a light on those who bring their full, authentic selves to do what they love, make no apologies, and don't try to fit into other people's boxes. With your host, Carla Taylor, who, after years of being inspired by the brilliantly shining people she was meeting, decided others need to hear these stories too. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show. I hope you're a returning person, but if not, welcome for the first time to the Bring Your Brilliance show. And today, we have the honor and privilege of talking with Michael Reynolds. And our topic today is that you are not your business. And I'm excited to dig into this topic with you. We've been talking a lot about personal brand and your identity and making sure you are fully yourself and authentically you everywhere you go. We had a great session with Tiffany Lanier talking about that very thing of not hiding parts of yourself. So now we are going to switch that up a little bit and talk about, okay, so yes, you're your authentic self wherever you go, but you are not your business. And there are two separate identities there. So that's what we're going to dig into today. I'm so excited about this topic. Um, I actually met Michael decades ago, I think at a B&I group, uh, but he is somebody that I have been following his career. He's a powerful business owner. Uh, he is someone who is passionate about entrepreneurship and financial education. Uh, Michael founded and co-founded a number of successful businesses, including a training company, a software company, and a virtual staffing firm. After 23 years as the co-founder and owner of FinWeb, which is what he was doing when I met him, which was a phenomenal digital marketing agency, he sold that agency in order to focus on what he loves, which is helping people improve their financial health and advising entrepreneurs. So years ago, Michael developed an itch to work in financial services. He became licensed to help people with investments and financial needs. At the time, it was purely a passion project. And then his clientele grew organically, and he developed a strong attachment to the process of managing money, which is always a good thing, right, when <laughs> we have money to manage, and helping others do the same, all while running his agency, starting his new businesses, getting married, and becoming a new dad. So most recently, in 2018, he founded Elevation Financial, an independent registered investment advisor focused on helping entrepreneurs with financial planning and investing. So, Michael, that is quite the intro, quite the background. Welcome to the show. Wow, thank you, Carla. That is quite. The, it sounds so impressive when I hear it. I'm, uh, I'm afraid I, I, I'm not sure I could live up to the, <laughs> to how you make me sound. But I really appreciate it. It's so good to talk to you again. We did meet at BNI, I think, um, many yes. moons ago, which is a great group, many, and we had a lot of ago. fun. Yeah. And yeah, so it's really, really great to to be with you again. I, I'm honored. I am too, and I'm so happy to have connected and be able to bring this very important topic. I love you and I had a, a conversation about exactly this thing and, and, and even the fact that lately I think the world is changing a bit where everyone was really identified by, and it's still happening, I think, that everybody was identified by what, what do you do? What do you do for work? You know, And that's been kind of this age-old yeah. conversation, but because – the world is changing so much. It was never a good idea, I don't think, anyway, and we can dig more into that. But I think especially because the world is changing so much and businesses aren't, you know, they used to stay at the top of the New York Stock Exchange for 50 or 60 years, and now the average is 15 to 20 years or less, you know. And so things are happening faster and faster, yeah. and people are changing faster and faster. And so your your brand of who you are, your personal brand, is very different from your business brand in terms of it goes everywhere no matter what you're doing, and your business brand is the business that it is. So um, let's just jump right into that. I want to hear from you. You and I talked a little bit about actually the concept of parallel entrepreneurism. So let's start right, right. there with what is that and what does that mean, and then I just want to hear all your awesome wisdom as we talk through this. Yeah, sure. So I, for so long I thought it was crazy, and here's why I thought it was crazy. I... <laughs> Everyone is <laughs> so that's a great way to start it. So I, a lot of people are always <laughs> saying, "Hey, focus on you know one thing. Focus on you know being great at this at this one thing and and do that thing really well." Which is great advice. I'm not knocking the advice. It's great, but 
I, I found myself, you know, focusing at the time I was with my digital agency that I um, that I was running at the time, and it was um, fairly successful. I, we had some some really um, great things going on there, serving great clients. But mm -hmm. my personality is such that I like to explore many different things. I like to explore many different ideas, many different concepts, opportunities, and I kept finding myself wanting to. You know, start new businesses, start new projects, explore new things, um, learn new skills, all these different things I really enjoy doing. And I kept feeling like I was crazy because the message I kept feeling like I was hearing was, hey, focus on this one thing and, and be good at that. And and so uh, after a while, I just kind of thought, like I said, I was crazy. I just kind of, you know, felt like there was something wrong with me. And then I read this really interesting book called The Parallel Entrepreneur. I believe the author is Ryan Buckley, uh, called The Parallel Entrepreneur. And he basically wrote this whole – I mean, it's a short book, but it's a its a book about this concept of, hey, there are people like me out there who love to start multiple businesses, run them successfully, and generate multiple streams of income with more than one successful business and continue to, to run them concurrently even start new things. So the term serial entrepreneur is what most of us think of, uh, but what that literally means is starting a business – exiting, starting a new one, exiting, and in kind of a serial fashion, you know, go from business to business. But a parallel entrepreneur mm -hmm. is someone who runs multiple businesses at the same time successfully um, in full operation. So I discovered there were other people like me out there, and I was really grateful to read this book and say, wow, there's the light bulb moment of it's okay to be the kind of person that runs multiple ventures at the same time, and you can actually be great at at all of them, or at least more than one business at the same time. And that kind of led me down the path of the conversation of, well, if you're running multiple ventures, how do you, how do you think about them? Are you, are you going to follow the, the typical path of like, hey, I'm so intertwined in my business that there's, you know, a very blurry line, or do I think about it differently? And so I came to the conclusion that it's important to think about it differently. Well, and I, I love everything that you just said about that. And I think there's a, a big misconception. First of all, the focus on one thing at a time. People hear that, it's drilled into them, it's about niching down, but what people forget to the rest of the sentences and then do the next thing. <laughs> so you might be focusing yeah. on one thing at a time in this day or this week or this month or this year, but that doesn't mean you have to narrow yourself only to that one thing for the rest of however long. And so I think that's one one factor that I hear a lot of people getting hung up on is, but I don't want to be just one thing. And then the other piece is the word successfully. <laughs> so uh, another misconception is, oh, well, you've got your hand in multiple businesses. Oh, I don't respect somebody who has, you know, three different things or four different things or five different things on LinkedIn at the same time because clearly they must not be successful in one. They're just jumping from thing to thing. And that's, that's yeah, a, a judgment yeah. that I think a lot of people make when they see that. But the difference is, and one of the things that I just I love about you is you are a very successful businessman no matter what you do. And so unlike people who try one thing that didn't work, I'm going to try another thing and that didn't work and I'm going to keep them all going because I don't know what one to pick, that is not who you are. You are the epitome of somebody who is, has such a strong business sense. You've built up – how how big was your, your agency, SpinWeb, at its heyday? Um, it hovered around 10 people, uh, give or take. So we've had as high as 14 people and as low as, mm -hmm. well, zero, obviously, but, <laughs> you know, one or two. But, uh, yeah, well, yeah, it hovered. Um, <laughs> when I sold it, we had seven people on the team. So yeah, I kind of okay. hovered around that 10-person mark, like a lot of agencies that size. And, uh, and, and I think it's funny. I want, I want to back up to one thing you, you said because you okay. said um, – something very nice, which is, you know, I'm the epitome of successful. And I just want to kind of share, I don't post my failures on Facebook. So <laughs> there are plenty of failures <laughs> in my past from things I've tried that didn't work. So, uh, so I appreciate you saying that, but there are certainly some failures in, in the closet. Don't, don't be make a mistake. <laughs> well, and I think that is the case for everyone. And I think that's also a really refreshing trend that I'm seeing is that people are being more open about the failures along the way and even having fail fests and things like that to, yeah, to say, Hey, yeah. Success isn't just the, the pretty social media version of all the high points. There's a lot of low points that get us to those high points. And I love that people are being more open and sharing the journey and not yeah. just the the pockets of success that, that, that are the front <laughs> that they want to show to everyone else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so sorry, you were asking um, a question asked, uh, originally. Yeah, so well, I, I was saying – 
so when I met you, you were doing SpinWeb. I had gone to your offices. In fact, I think I actually used your office for a couple of my meetings. Um, and you had a lot of big clients and were very, very successful. And everything that I've seen you be a part of, um, both when I was working more closely with you and even from afar, it's not uh, something where you're just jumping from thing to thing, but you really are building and growing and having, um, even like we talked about in your intro, the, this organic growth of your client uh, versus having to go out and sell a lot of it because you're you're so good at what you do. There's a lot of, of word of mouth referrals and that sort of thing, and that's one of the best compliments I think you can ever have. Well, thank you. Thank to have you. your business grow or, organically. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I want to dig in a little bit more than to – this whole concept of parallel entrepreneurship, um, one of the things I've always, I started to, you know, you study successful people, right? And the biggest successes, the most successful people, if you look at even people who have like uh, super famed celebrity status, they are doing one thing. I mean, look at Oprah, look at Steve Harvey, look at all these different people who have their hand in multiple different yeah, things at true. the same time. <laughs> because I think when you're operating at that level, you get things done faster, you're more efficient, you're more productive, you know how it works, you know how to make it happen. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so productivity is a um, kind of a, I guess, a passion of mine as well. So I like really good systems, I like really good processes, I like really good organizational skills. So um, I am fairly ruthless about certain productivity elements and how I do things. So, for example, I hate paper so much. Everyone that knows me knows how much I hate paper because, to me, paper just kind of slows everything down. So I make an effort to make every single aspect of my businesses completely paperless. So everything's stored in the cloud. Everything's paperless. Um, I'm pretty ruthless about project management systems. And I think you kind of have to really be committed to productivity to be able to to run multiple ventures. I think you have to really be able to to juggle different things by using the right system. So that's kind of one thing I focus on is being very productive through system tools, software, paperless. And that really helps me stay organized quite a bit, even down to how I manage my calendar. So, you know, for example, I, you know, with multiple businesses, I have multiple calendars in different G Suite accounts. Well, you know, that can get to be a nightmare. So, you know, what I do is I have one master calendar, which is my personal Gmail account, which alludes to separating business from personal. So my personal life is my calendar, but then I, you know, share into that calendar all my other calendars from businesses, and then I link up Calendly in such a way that it, you know, only shows people what they need to see based on the business. So it's really actually pretty clean once you get it set up. So there's a lot of little hacks I use to kind of stay organized. That's that's so awesome, and I I do think, like you said, you have to have that one master calendar. Uh, you, so you mentioned Calendly. What are some of the other tools that you personally have found to be super helpful that are your go-to? Always have to use this no matter what kind of business I'm running. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a great question. So I love Wonderlist. So Wonderlist is my central, like, personal go-to um, to-do list app. So Wonderlist is awesome. It has all sorts of things like recurring tasks and multiple sections and cloud, you know, synchronization and everything. So I love Wonderlist. Um, that's been awesome. Um, I use G Suite for everything, Google Drive, um, Google Email, Google Calendar, all the Google tools for communication. Uh, that works really well. Um, from a project management standpoint, I really like Asana these days. It's a really great okay. project management tool that's really lightweight, free. Uh, Slack. I use Slack quite a bit for internal communications with people I work with. So those are some of the tools I, I really love. What are your favorites? Well, I really love Trello. Um, that's one of my go-to's. Oh, yeah. I do Trello's a lot great. with G Suite. Yep. <laughs> um, so I like the visual and the. it feels like I'm working with sticky notes and that sort of thing. But Speaking of efficiency and productivity, we are actually coming up on our first break. So nice. we, uh, we will be right back to talk a little bit more about these tools. You're listening to Bring Your Brilliance with me, Carla Taylor, here on Inspired Choices Network, and we will be right back. We all have a personal brand. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. What if you knew how to clearly and confidently communicate your value in a compelling way? Tune in to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show with personal branding and LinkedIn strategist Carla Taylor to discover the tools, resources, and inspiration you need to get started and keep growing. Are you ready to make your mark? 
Learn how to bring your brilliance by listening to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Mountain, and 7 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. This is the Bring Your Brilliance radio show with personal branding and LinkedIn strategist Carla Taylor. To join today's conversation, call in the U.S. at 815-880-8255 or Canada at 613-800-8736 or Skype at Inspired Choices Network. Or ask a question or send a comment by email at bringyourbrilliance at gmail.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. I am Carla Taylor. This is Bring Your Brilliance. Today, our show topic is that you are not your business. And right before break, we were talking with Michael Reynolds of Elevation Financial, and we were talking about productivity and great tools that um, that Michael has found to be very productive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you had one more that you were going to talk about. Yeah, I forgot to mention LastPass. Um, that's probably my favorite, so I can't believe I left it out. So um, <laughs> I think it's impossible to to be organized with doing this without LastPass because it stores all of your passwords in the cloud in one place. Um, I have multiple tools. I, lo- I have probably like 50 to 60 different tools I use throughout all my businesses, and so it stores all my passwords and keeps everything straight. So I wanted to throw in LastPass for a shout-out too. Awesome. So that's actually one I hadn't heard about, and that's great to know. And I think – what you just said about having so many different tools, you've got to have the structure and the support and it takes a little bit of time to set it up. But once you set it up, then everything else just runs so much more smoothly when you do have all of those tools in place to help you with that productivity. Um, So one of the things that I know you were doing and and one of your clients was actually uh, the results only work environment. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about, how that has evolved for you, and clearly you're living it <laughs> by focusing on results. <laughs> uh, but talk to me a little bit more. We just started to dig into how you're able to successfully run these different businesses. One of the things was these tools, but what are some of the other things that you have found that are, are very helpful for you? Well, you mentioned results-only work environment, and I'm going to try hard not to spiral that into its own show because it really is its own show, so I'll kind of <laughs> summarize it. So, um well, you opened a can of worms on that one. <laughs> so, uh, results only work environment or, or, uh, or row for short is a system developed by Callie Ressler and Jody Thompson, who are consultants that developed it. And basically it is a, a mindset shift of shifting your culture in a business from focusing on, you know, things like presenteeism and, you know, filling time and, you know, hours and sitting at a desk to things that really matter, like the results. And usually what it looks like is, a company that embraces row uh, typically will uh, will not worry about work schedules or locations. They're typically virtual uh, in terms of um, what they can, how they can allow people to work. So, a company that is is a results only work environment focuses on the results, and then the other stuff attaches to the results. So, you know, for example, um, in the agency that I that I owned for for a couple of decades, you know, we didn't have people work a certain work schedule. They could work wherever they want to, whenever they want to, as long as the work got done. And that's kind of what a road mm-hmm. looks like. So that's a really super summarized version of it. But I think mm-hmm. in this, the age we're in now, we have technology, we have the internet, we have tools, we have all these ways of allowing us to work any way we want to. And so I, I like to encourage people to embrace that, You know, allow people to work wherever they want to, set up a whole virtual company, um, I would say, I mean, every single one of my businesses are, are truly virtual. I mean, we have an office for 
um, you know, that we use here and there for certain things. But in general, um, you know, when I start a company now, I don't consider office space. Now, if I were starting a flower shop, obviously I would, <laughs> but or a, you know, a, right. a, a very locally focused business where in-person business is the the norm. But um, when you're starting a business, you can start a business with an internet connection and a laptop, and that's literally all you need. And so it's a really exciting time we live in where you can have an idea and you can launch a service business or an online business very quickly, very easily, and very inexpensively. And and I think it's beautiful. That's a really great thing. I agree. I think that it has become easier and easier, and it just astounds me even from what it was 10 years ago when I first started my business and to where it is today. And it's it's so exciting that it is almost like the, the great equalizer that anybody, anywhere, as long as you have an Internet connection. And and it's, it's helping people yeah. even come out of poverty and, and giving people opportunities where they never had them before, people who – live in really remote locations and never had the opportunity to have a a bigger business in their local town um, can now have so much more access to so many things. It's really an exciting time that we're living in. Yeah, agreed. Um, So let's, we took kind of a deep dive into the productivity and how to run all of these different businesses, but let's get back to what we're talking about today, which is separating your brand your business versus your personal brand. So let's dive into that now. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, so the conversation that we're having is kind of focused on on that to some extent, and I love that concept because I kind of lived it. So entrepreneurs are really predictable, and and when I say that, I, I've been one of them, and I still am one of them. We, you know, we're very predictable on certain things we do, and when you start a business, it's very easy and kind of the norm to decide that your business is part of you. Um, when I started SpinWeb 23 years ago, um, it was exciting. It was, I had never launched a business before. I felt like it was the right thing to do and it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I I launched this business and suddenly it was all consuming. It was basically just part of my identity. Uh, you know, I used my business email account as my personal account. I didn't even have a personal email account. Uh, my business calendar was my personal calendar. Everything was attached to the business. Basically, my life revolved around the business, and everything else just kind of fit in accordingly. But the central focus of my identity was really wrapped up in my business. Now, some people can do that, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong necessarily. I found that over time, that had some some challenges. And coming out of selling a business and kind of you know shifting my perspective a bit, I really believe in an alternate kind of perspective. So, you know, again, the the pattern that a lot of people follow when they're running a business is they, you know, they feel like it's an extension of themselves. They are their business. Their self-worth is wrapped up into it. Um, I don't Mm -hmm. think that's necessarily emotionally healthy for everyone. And it wasn't for me. Not at all. Because, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, when you lose that big client or that big sale or, or, you know, a a client criticizes something you're doing, like you really take it personally because it's like, hey, that's my baby. That's my that's my heart out there, um, you know, on the website. That's my that's my heart wrapped up in the business. That's my soul. And it's like, wow, you know, when someone criticizes or something goes wrong, it really gets you down. And it got me really into some some depression a lot of times, like some really deep depression of, you know, what am I doing with my life? And you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs end up there at some point. <laughs> But, um, it is. It's actually a, a huge hazard of being an entrepreneur is that you can get so wrapped up and feel like if something in the business fails that you're a failure. And I think that's actually a really real struggle that every entrepreneur feels at some point, even if it's fleeting. But some people get really stuck there, too. I, th- I think that's a really important part of this topic and why, like you said, it's not yeah. emotionally healthy to be so close. Yeah, so I um again after not not really right after some but kind of before I was selling the business when I was kind of starting to decide okay, I want to do something different, I really started to shift my perspective a bit. Um I started thinking of my business uh more like an asset, like my house or my, you know, investment accounts or, or another asset on my personal balance sheet. So it seems like a really subtle shift, but it's a very significant shift because and this is kind of where it goes into my you know, financial planning um, mindset here, which is what I do. So I, I really encourage business owners, including myself, to not think of their business as 
their life, but they think of their business as an asset they can put in a box and put on their balance sheet just like their home, just like you know a, a car that's worth something or you know a piece of art or you know their investment accounts or whatever has value as an asset. You place it on your your balance sheet just like anything else. Once you start to do that, you become more objective. I became more objective. I made better decisions. I planned my my future better. And it really was a very um, positive perspective and a better perspective for me. So I think um, out of all the benefits, emotionally healthier was, was one of the benefits for me. Well, and that's such a great point that you do have to have objectivity. You do have to get some perspective if you're so close to something you really just can't even see what's going on around you. And I love that analogy of it's, it's like your house is an asset. And so if something goes wrong in your house, maybe it might hurt a little bit financially, but you're not going to feel like, oh, my God, there's something wrong with me because the toilet broke, you know? Yeah, you know, the toilet <laughs> broke. got to fix really it. sucks, but okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's great. So, uh, yeah, so tell me a little bit more about this. So you've, you've written actually a whole article about, separating your identity from your business. Um, so let's take yeah, a, let's yeah. a little bit more into that. Yeah, so there's a few aspects I like to kind of point out about this this concept of being a little more objective. So the emotional part of it is very real. So, you know, does it mean mm-hmm. that I live life in this state of perfection and zen and everything's great and kittens and rainbows? No, it doesn't. But <laughs> it means that if my, I kind of call it business codependence. If my business codependence was like a 9 or a 10 before, it's more like a three or less now, which means I can, I, I'm more at peace with decisions. I'm, I'm more, um, I, I just have a better relationship with my businesses. It's just they're, they're tools and assets and great things that make me happy, but they're not who I am. So that's the emotional part of it. So, so beyond that, there's also a more logistical kind of technical advantage to separating yourself, and that is you can step back and get a true sense of what your business is is valued. So when you start to think of your business as an asset, you start to think about how you can make it more valuable. And that's a different way of thinking than someone who's in the trenches saying, well, how do I just get the next client? And how do I, you know, you know, make more money, which is a great goal, but, you know, raw income is one thing, but making the business itself more valuable is a whole different ballgame. And so when you decide to, think of your business as an asset, you think differently and you make different decisions. So instead of doing everything yourself, you might outsource more and hire more and train people to do things that that you shouldn't be doing. Um, You might be more mindful about uh, expenditures and and how you structure the business. You might be more mindful of the types of clients you take on. You might be more mindful of how you, uh, what your relationship looks like with those clients and what service engagements look like and how they're structured. All these things come into play. And so when you start thinking of your business as an asset that has value that can shrink or grow, you often will make better decisions because the ultimate goal would be either to have a business that generates income for you and or you might want to sell it. And if a business has value, then you can sell it for something and it legitimately is an asset that can give you a return. And if you're the owner that's wrapped up into running the business, it's hard to sell. Yeah, that's such a good point, too. You've got to not position yourself that the business can't run without you because, like you said, there's nothing to sell, but also you're going to run yourself into the ground, (laughs) and then you can't step away. You can't take a break. You can't have that work-life balance that's so important to have time for everything else that matters in your life beyond your business. And And I think it's also key to being a parallel entrepreneur because you can't. You know, well, unless you have multiple personalities, you really can't be part of every single business <laughs> and have that be your identity. <laughs> right, um, right. So, and it, it does give you that objectivity to, because you're focused on the value of the business and and then it helps you focus on those activities that bring value to the business versus sometimes we get so caught up in, oh, I've got to do this, I should be doing that, people want me to be here and there. I need to be doing social media. I need to be doing networking. I need to be doing all these other activities that may or may not have anything to do with building value into that business. It's just something that they, they've heard along the way that was a good idea or everyone else seems to be doing it. Yeah, and you may never sell it, but it's nice to have the option. Right. Well, and at least you can take a vacation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you're not so wrapped up into it. 
so um so you said the kind of the main things that that you found is by detaching and I love your phrase about the codependence with your business and the relationship that you have with it um but that has allowed you to actually be more productive have higher value and um and and the emotional health part as well um is there anything else that you feel like has been kind of key to you talk a lot about mindfulness of you use that phrase several times so talk to me a little bit more about even just the mindset that it takes to be able to do all this yeah yeah after the break we can definitely hit that yeah okay well um then (laughs) we'll go ahead and and come back with that after the, the break this is carla taylor with the inspired choices network we're talking with michael renum from elevation financial and we will be right back we all have a personal brand It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. What if you knew how to clearly and confidently communicate your value in a compelling way? Tune in to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show with personal branding and LinkedIn strategist Carla Taylor to discover the tools, resources, and inspiration you need to get started and keep growing. Are you ready to make your mark? Learn how to bring your brilliance by listening to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Mountain, and 7 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. This is the Bring Your Brilliance radio show with personal branding and LinkedIn strategist Carla Taylor. To join today's conversation, call in the U.S. at 815-880-8255 or Canada at 613-800-8736 or Skype at Inspired Choices Network. Or ask a question or send a comment by email at bringyourbrilliance at gmail.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show on Inspired Choices Network. I am Carla Taylor. We are here with Michael Reynolds talking about uh, the fact that you are not your business. We just talked through several of those points. And we left off on the topic of mindfulness. So talk to me a little bit more about that, Michael. Oh, I'm not even sure what mindfulness means, to be honest. I just, <laughs> <laughs> I think I use it in phrases like I know. Of, but I guess uh, I, I, I probably don't really know what it means. But <laughs> I know. I, I To me, mindfulness, I guess, is I just feel like it's a state of mind where you're more aware and you're, um, you're self-aware, you're aware of your surroundings, you're aware of your interaction with, with others and your business and personal life. And I guess it, to me it's being being aware and being um, open and receptive to, to how you're interacting with your environment. So that's probably a pretty terrible definition, but what <laughs> how it translates know, to the good. topic. How, yeah, okay, we'll go with it then. <laughs> so kind of how it translates is um, – when you are, we kind of left off talking about, you know, being wrapped up in your business and being so focused on, you know, running your everyday operations in your business that you can't see outside of it. And so that's a, a couple of layers to talk about there. So one layer, again, is we talked about the option of valuing and selling your business. So if you are so critical to running your business that you can't, can't be really detached or kind of unplugged from the business without failing, then you've got a problem when it comes to selling it or valuing it because you are basically the engine driving the business. So, you know, Mm -hmm. being mindful of that to me would mean, you know, hey, understanding that your ego might enjoy the fact that you're really important to the business. And my ego has been there plenty of times and I still struggle with that. So, you know, when I was um, running SpinWeb, my ego said, hey, I'm really important. I'm a, you know, I go out there and I speak at conferences and I, you know, do marketing strategy for my clients and I'm really involved in this and this and this and all these things. And it really fed my ego, and I felt really kind of temporarily good about it, but it mm-hmm. wasn't healthy for me or for the business long term. So being mindful of that and developing some mindfulness around acknowledging that and kind of facing it and saying, okay, this is something about myself that I'm kind of looking at and saying, what, where is this leading me? And the answer was it was leading me nowhere. <laughs> it was leading me to just kind of go on about you know, status quo in my business. And I'm not really a status quo kind of person. I like growth and momentum and success and new things. And that wasn't where I wanted to go. And so I made the 
intentional decision to start to slowly unplug myself from the operations of the business. So I got to the point where, you know, when when the the company that wanted to acquire Spinweb came along and was interested, it was a very easy transition because they acquired the business assets without me, and it was incredibly smooth because no balls got dropped due to me getting unplugged. I had already kind of offloaded those tasks to the right people who were doing a better job than me in the company. So that was a really aha moment for me is, is being mindful of my role in the business and how what I thought was like a dopamine rush or an ego boost was was a good thing. It really wasn't. It was limiting me from long-term potential growth. So that's, I don't know if that mm-hmm. at all answers the question. But that's kind of where my head went when you asked about mindfulness. Yeah, no, no, no. And I, I love this point that you just made about, you know, a, a true leader is somebody who hires the right people and puts them in the right places and then lets them do the thing that they were hired to exactly. do. Exactly. Get out of their get way. Get out of their way. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's I could not agree more. A, a big theme in any size business that so many leaders think to be important, to be valuable, actually, that they have to do all the work themselves or they have a hard time delegating or letting go of some of the critical tasks. But in fact, what I have seen, and I've worked with hundreds, maybe even thousands of leaders across every size organization, and the people who are truly the best leaders set everything up and everyone else up for success so that they can go and do and become that well-oiled machine, and that leader is never critical to any of the tasks that need done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think a business has the most value. You can tell I get value. about this. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh-huh. exactly. I'm with you. And a business has the most value to me when the owner is operationally irrelevant or, or minimally relevant. Mm-hmm. And there are enough systems in place that consistent revenue is flowing without the owner's involvement. Now, that can sound scary to a lot of people because a lot of people say, well, mm-hmm. why did I start this business in the first place if I'm just going to like not do anything with it? Well, I mean, it's pretty rare that you just don't do anything. I mean, you've got stuff to do. <laughs> no matter how operationally right, relevant right. you are, you've got stuff to do. Um, so don't worry that you're going to just have nothing to do. That will never happen. Um, but it's, it sounds scary to, to do that because when you're in startup mode, which, you know, frankly, I'm in startup mode with Elevation Financial right now. It's, it's less than a year old and it's really exciting. And mm-hmm. I am operationally a hundred percent necessary to the business. There's no one else. There's just me. So that's fine right now. And I'm having a blast. It's awesome. I'm really loving the startup mode, right. but in five years, I fully expect to have a team in place, a small team that is doing some of the service delivery, some of the other stuff, the operations, and so that I can start to build out a team that is going to be even stronger as a team. And so um, when you get to that point in a business, it's it's really exciting because you're no longer, again, trying to get that dopamine ego boost of you know putting out a fire and thinking you're so important. You're now operating at a level of of strategy and and vision and being able to design your life the way you want. And ultimately that's kind of what what matters to me is being able to design my life in the way that I want. And mm-hmm. when you're sucked into a business, that's, you know, your whole identity, you can't really do that as well. Well, and I think that is exactly right and and I think there is a different differentiator here between the types of businesses if you want a lifestyle business that's you providing a service and just you and you don't intend to grow it beyond that, then I don't think this is necessarily applies to you because you are that doing that service. Like if you're a massage therapist and you want to be massaging, that's fantastic. Or you might also be a massage therapist who then wants to get out of that and, and have bigger massage parlors everywhere and not that they call them parlors anymore. But <laughs> yeah, a clinic or a, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I think you're. I think you've got a point. <laughs> I mean, it, from an operational, yeah, from an operational standpoint, that's true. I mean, if you're, let's say, you know, go back to the example you gave, a solo massage therapist, you know, you're not going to necessarily, you know, unplug yourself from the business, but you can still separate your identity from the business enough that it still is thought of as an asset, and that might lead you to make decisions that you might not otherwise make that could be good for the business, that could give you other ways to grow your income and make it more of a a lifestyle practice where you don't have to work all the time. You can work less and design mm-hmm. your lifestyle around this and have the life you want. So I think you can still, right. the concept of separating your identity from your business still applies, even if operationally it might look different from, from person to person. I agree. And I think there, 
like I said, there are some people like if if you really enjoy that service that you're providing, if you're a massage therapist who wants to to be massaging people, then you kind of do have to trade time for money, right? But if you are yeah, someone yeah. who maybe you are the practitioner who wants to do the practitioner part sometimes, but you also want to get out of that that time for money game and you want to find the things that are scalable and and that can can get you you know, that passive income or, or income different times, different kinds of revenue streams, then I think yeah. you're right. That's something I've evolved in my own life and business. When I started out as a consultant, I was, you know, marketing myself as a person showing up at your business, trading time <laughs> for money. And I've shifted a lot more and more of my business into the different things that I can do, creating courses or creating content or all the different things that I can do that I don't necessarily have to trade my hours for, but I still want to do some of that. So I, I have a, yeah, that, that yeah. balance of what part I'm doing versus what part that I'm scaling and able to do in different ways. And sometimes it could be as simple as maybe you still trade time for dollars, but you raise your hourly rate so much that you love doing it. Maybe you you know cut your workload exactly. in half <laughs> and your income triples, and that's okay. There's there's no one right answer necessarily to scaling your income. It could be as simple as, as that. Not that that's simple. That takes work. But that, <laughs> I make it that's sound a so great simple. point. And and I. But it is if you're if you're really confident in what you do and you do it very well and you recognize that you you can have that, that higher dollar amount and I've actually had had other business owners talk about you know if somebody easily accepts your rate then double it and then if they easily accept that rate well, double it again and and keep doing that until you get to a point where people start to push back and then you've probably found a good yeah. a good hourly rate or whatever it is that you're charging for so I do think there's a lot of different kind of tricks to how you can figure out what that is, what that rate is for you. And then, like you said, like I found if I've reduced my rates and then I start working at that level, I don't want more clients because I don't want to be working that hard for that low of a dollar amount. And so then it doesn't incentivize yeah. me to sell more because I don't want to be selling that. And so that's something I've had to evolve. I think every business owner goes through just so many layers of learning when you first start out, everything's brand new. And that first year, especially, you're just figuring it all out, you know. Um, so yeah. it's it's all those things that come with time. And that's the beauty of having shows like this or other people that you can hear from to learn some of what did they learn along the way. So maybe you can learn it a little faster. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I, uh, we are actually yeah, – go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was well, going to mention that – um, you're right. We're a good rants to break, so I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's talk about that, though, when we get back. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And, uh, again, this is Carla Taylor. We are here talking with Michael Reynolds from Elevation Financial with all of his wisdom and even financial expertise about running your business and growing your business. And we will be right back. We all have a personal brand. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. What if you knew how to clearly and confidently communicate your value in a compelling way? Tune in to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show with personal branding and LinkedIn strategist Carla Taylor to discover the tools, resources, and inspiration you need to get started and keep growing. Are you ready to make your mark? Learn how to bring your brilliance by listening to the Bring Your Brilliance radio show every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Mountain, and 7 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. This is the Bring Your Brilliance radio show with personal branding and LinkedIn strategist Carla Taylor. To join today's conversation, call in the U.S. at 815-880-8255 or Canada at 613-800-8736 or Skype at Inspired Choices Network. Or ask a question or send a comment by email at bringyourbrilliance at gmail.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to Bring Your Brilliance here on Inspired Choices Network. I am Carla Taylor. We are here talking with Michael Reynolds from Elevation Financial. And I cannot believe how fast this is going. We are actually already at the almost know, very right? end of our show. And I feel like we just barely got started. So let's continue what we were saying earlier. And then I want to hear a little bit more about what you're doing now and what's next for you. 
Sure, sure. So um, as I kind of mentioned before, I'm in startup mode with uh, Elevation Financial. It's kind of my my newest business. So um, I used to have, um, I think, six or seven businesses, and I'm down to four. So I'm I'm kind of getting better at that. <laughs> oh, wow. I, uh, so <laughs> Elevation Financial, I, I'm the sole owner, and I'm a partner in three other businesses. So uh, that's one thing we can do a whole different show on at some point as well, is the value of the right partner in, in businesses and, and partnerships mm. in business. But we can... We can kind of hit that at a different time, but but I, I will say that finding great Huge partners topic. Um, is a really really great thing. So that's been been a real real blessing. So, so yeah, so what I'm up to, um, I am focused on growing Elevation Financial. I'm getting new clients every week or so, kind of growing organically, and um, I'm really kind of bringing my my marketing background to the table to help grow the business. So it's a very virtual uh, company. It's um, I work with clients all over the country. We do video conference. I, I, as you might have guessed, I'm I'm paperless and you know e-signatures and everything's electronic. <laughs> so it's really easy for me to work with people all over the country. So I'm a really I'm really focused on uh, micro business entrepreneurs, people that are solo business owners, or we have a couple team members, really small teams, and I kind of do a dual service. I, I give them business coaching as well as financial planning. So it's kind of um, a way of helping people look at their personal financial plan through this lens we've been talking about today, the lens of, okay, let's let's not get wrapped up so much in your business from a, a life standpoint. Let's call it an asset. Let's grow the value. Let's help it, you know, let, let's add value to your personal balance sheet as well. So that's what I'm up to with uh, Elevation Financial. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. Growth mode is fun to be, fun to be back there again in growth mode. Yeah, it's, it's an exciting time, isn't it? It's, it's, Lots of ups and downs, <laughs> but um, so are you mostly looking working with people who are are in startup mode themselves, or do you look for people who are more established or even getting ready to sell, or what kind of stages are you looking for businesses? So it kind of hovers around that beginning stage, um, but beginning stage doesn't doesn't always mean time. So someone that's been in business five or even ten years, uh, you know, I've met business owners who are um, still kind of at a stage where they need some help, you know, getting to the next level or kind of getting unstuck with something. So um, I do work with a lot of people that are kind of early in their business. Uh, maybe they're one or two or three years in, or maybe they're thinking of starting a business. Maybe they're leaving a job uh, as an employee and they're kind of starting a side hustle. So there's no real one, like, specific point in their journey. Um, I just tend to work really well with people that are uh, again, they're, they're micro business entrepreneurs who want to get value from having an organized, successful, growing business, as well as get their per personal financial plan in order and kind of tie it all together. So I hope that answers your question. I probably didn't do a great job of clarifying that. But yeah, so micro business entrepreneurs, probably your your audience is a, is a great uh, great example. Well, and and what's so wonderful is they're not just getting – financial help or just getting business coaching, but you are able to bring both in to help them not only free themselves up for more time and ability to do things in their own lives, but also do it in a way that's growing the business, which is, I think, probably for almost anybody, it's <laughs> almost every business yeah, owner yeah. to have both of those things. And my background in marketing and time. technology it comes to, um, is really helpful because, you know, I I go as far as helping my clients set up uh, Facebook campaigns sometimes because I have a marketing background and they need help with that, and that's something I can do. So I have a, a pretty um, useful background when it comes to helping businesses grow, so that's come in handy <laughs> quite a bit. I bet. So what is kind of your, your biggest thing looking back, maybe one or two things that you wish you had known when you first started on your own journey that now that you know – it has helped you the most. Oh boy, um, it's a big question. That is a great <laughs> question. I'm really, I'm always really bad at big open-ended questions like that. So let me try to pick something off the list. So, um, what I wish I had known. So this is kind of a, um, I guess an unexpected one or a different one. But I would say be more, be faster to take the high road. Um, and this is sort of not necessarily mm. related to the conversation, but it's it's an honest answer. Um, when you are, I guess it's kind of related because when you're so wrapped up in your business that it's it's very much attached to your identity, you take everything personally, like I mentioned at the beginning of our show. And so I think that led me too much to react too much uh, in a negative way. So, you know, when a, 
when a customer criticizes you or uh you know something goes wrong with a um a business relationship or something happens um it's really easy to just kind of get mean and kind of fight back and get defensive and and take it personally and I did that way too much at the beginning and I I wished someone had mm-hmm. or I wished I had figured it out I guess or someone had you know um, coached me in a way or or I had coached myself in a way to kind of figure it out more that it's never worth it to do that um always always take the high road well, always I- be better than the negative place that the, the situation is taking you well, and that's, that's a great point. I think people do get really reactive and get like, I need to stand up for me and my business or whatever. And they spend so much time and energy, not only in the, the moments of fighting it themselves, but then all the energy it saps from everything else that you're doing. So it really takes even uh, way more time than I think you initially calculate. And that's part of how you do make space and time in your life for the different things that you're doing for your business and your life. <clears throat> and, and, yeah. you know, it helps with everything else that you're doing. So I, I love that that's the one thing that you talked about. Is there anything else that <laughs> we should know or how can we find you going forward from here since we are almost out of time? Oh yeah. Yeah. We're almost out of time, but yeah, I would love to chat with anyone that wants to reach out. Uh, my website is elevationfinancial.com. And I'm super easy to find. You can book a discovery call on my contact page. You can just click that blue button and pick a time from my calendar and schedule a free discovery call. And if you just want to, you know, talk about what it looks like to work with me as a client, we can do that. If you just have general questions, I'll answer general questions and not try to sell you anything. Either way, totally fine. Feel free to reach out. Awesome. (laughs) Great. Thank you so very much. We really, really appreciate you sharing your time and your incredible wisdom. I think there's so many different topics we could continue to cover because, you are such a seasoned business over owner with so many different parts of your journey that you could, could definitely share. I look forward to seeing how much you grow Elevation Financial and how much your business actually helps all of these other businesses grow. So please, if you've been listening, if you're interested, as you heard uh, from Michael, he offers a free consultation. Do you work with people anywhere in the world or just in the U.S.? Just in the U.S., U.S. only, 50 states. Okay, so... In the U.S., reach out and give Michael a call. And um, I just am really appreciative of you taking this time to to walk through some of this with you. And I think you are modeling the way of what you teach, which is, which is also a wonderful thing. Uh, coming up next uh, week, we are going to be talking with the fabulous Judy Fox. She is actually uh, one of the top LinkedIn leaders, strategists. She does a bunch of things called LinkedIn Like a Fox. She's a really fun, awesome person. I can't wait to talk to her. Um, Michael, you've used LinkedIn a little bit for your business. Tell me a little bit about how you found that to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. I I like LinkedIn. It's not my favorite. Um, It's not as active or vibrant as as Facebook seems to be. But, um, yeah, I mean, I I share content on LinkedIn. I have conversations. I connect with people. So um, I think LinkedIn is is a great network if you don't expect too much out of it. <laughs> That's kind of my way of looking at it. Well, you and I are going to have to talk offline then because LinkedIn is actually becoming extremely vibrant, and that's what a lot of people don't quite know yet. So I'm happy to share that. Oh, it's with gotten you much better. More offline. Um, yeah, you need to school yeah, me on LinkedIn because it's, really it's gotten, gotten much better. You're right. You're right. I do. There's all kinds of new tools and things. They're actually coming out with new ones every day. And so I am happy to have that conversation yeah. with you because a lot of people are actually moving from Facebook to LinkedIn nowadays. So that's part of what we're yeah, going to be talking about true. next week with Judy. That's part of what I help people with, with Bring Your Brilliance, um, not only helping getting your voice nice. out there, but even figuring out what your voice is. And I help people uh, find their own career happiness and how to work happy and making sure that when you are – growing a business or multiple businesses that you're focused on the things that you really love to do and you want to be doing more of. Uh, I've got a program called the Career Happiness Project that kind of helps you dig into that and start with that at the core of anything that you're doing next. And uh, that's something that you can find through my website, which is www.itstimetobringit.com. And, of course, you can find me and connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, it's Carla J. Taylor if you're looking at the LinkedIn.com slash IN slash Carla J. Taylor. But please connect me with, it with, with me there as well. And I'm also happy to talk to any of you offline about LinkedIn strategies. And thank you so much for joining us thank today. You, Thanks and, for listening to yeah, another episode yeah. of Bring Your Brilliance with Carla Taylor. 
for the latest updates and info on personal branding, please follow and interact with Carla Taylor on LinkedIn. And be sure to visit www.itstimetobringit.com. Join Carla Taylor every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Mountain, and 7 a.m. Pacific on Inspired Choices.